what what I'm trying to present here is where Ken started his career. He started his career in science fiction and not in comic fandom for those of you that know him in, in comic fandom. But comic fandom really embraced him and, and still does. That's why this is a Ken Kruger tribute fest as well as just the, the first Oktoberfest. Jim and, and Wendy are going to speak to you because they know Ken much more personally uh, during his, his uh, comic uh, career than, than I did. For me, encountering Ken, I, I, I knew him as a kid. He uh, was a friend of my father's, and uh, my father uh, published books, and Ken would come over to our house and um, pick up uh, pocketbooks for resale, because my pop could get them for free from his warehouse, and so they had a side deal going. And Ken came over regularly with his partner, John Hall. And um, about every time I met John, uh, John would try to buy all my, hustle all, all my comic books out of me. And he didn't get my comic books, but uh, he got other things. And that was sort of the, the and that started um, when we moved out here uh, from Chicago when I was 10. So knowing Ken on a personal basis started when I was 10. And over the years, Ken was one of the very few people uh, in my among my father's peers, business friends, acquaintances, that recognized me. And this is important as a 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 year old, not just as a, a teen, a 17 year old, or something like that. Just all too often, the, my, my pop's friends would just ignore me and tell me to go away. And part of that is um, when Ken got involved with the 1970 uh, Comic Con, first one, he went back to his friends and asked my pop to speak here, which he did on um, First Amendment uh, issues. It wasn't interesting. Um, it didn't appeal much to uh, the, the crowd. He, was, he followed Bob Foster, who had a much more interesting and entertaining um, speech to give and had, had a packed crowd. But we were both there at the first con because of Ken. And over the years, uh, as I moved away from comic books and to other career fields, I still tried to come to the comic con. Every time I came to the con, I'd spot Ken. He, I, you know, he'd get me in for free. It was a very important thing. And it, was, it was a wonderful bond. And this is just to illustrate what Ken means to us each in our own way, what, what he did for us over the years. And uh, as Ken and I would bump into each other at, in his various incarnations, um, I tracked his uh, publishing. Uh, career, which is sort of unknown in, in comic fandom, but before he was a comic fan, he started out as a kid as a member of what's called First Fandom. And First Fandom is defined as those people that were involved in science fiction at the beginning, pre-1939. And so his involvement in the field goes that far back when he was 16, 17. His claim, which I couldn't verify, was that at 14 or so, he went to the first official science fiction convention. But what I, but I have been able to verify as part of his first fandom, and this is important because the awards and the politics, because actually this whole thing is about politics in a way. Uh, the whole nomination process by which people receive awards in, in the science fiction field, which differs a lot than you might think. Uh, it's actually very participatory. It's not something that's just assigned at random, but the, the very nature of participation kind of makes some results rather stilted. A good campaign can sway votes. It happens a lot for like the Nebula, or the, the, the fancier science fiction awards. So Ken was a member of First Fandom. I have this wonderful picture, if I can ever get past this point here, which may or not may not happen. I tried to cancel it, but uh, uh, like I say, it's a short sh show. It's photographs and the lead into what Ken did in the science fiction world. So Ken was a kid. At 17, he for sure was a member of this group that affectionately called themselves uh, the Slam Shack. That was what they were trying to do. Slam was a book that was published pre-World War II about um, mutants that come out of the atomic wars that can read minds and have tendrils. Fantastic book. 
the, it became a gag line for filler copy in the fanzines that were popular in the era, which were amateur press, which is how everybody met each other in science fiction. They didn't meet each other at, at conventions. That came sort of later. They started as members of amateur presses. SAPS, the Spectator Amateur Press, or FAPA, the Fantasy Amateur Press. And they met each other, and so they decided to get together and have conventions so they could see people they'd been corresponding with for five or 10 years. And that was an eye-opener in some cases, like Lee Hoffman, who was well known as a fan, and everybody opened up their, their heart and bared their souls to Lee. And lo and behold, at a convention in a very male-oriented world, she, sh she showed up and surprised everybody because they didn't know she was a woman. And Lee Hoffman went on to be, uh, become a, uh, a Western writer, not just science fiction, but Western, so a popular Western writer before she died. Uh, so those facts are the interesting, wow, oh, maybe step two. Uh, mm. uh, ignore that. Ignore what's on the screen, the man behind the screen. Don't just ignore the man behind the screen. So during his career, from um, during up, leading up to World War II, becoming involved in, in, in fandom, I've got this cute picture on the slideshow of uh, Ken in the slide shack with Frank Robinson who was a noted, famous science fiction writer who wrote, of all things, The Towering Inferno, part of The Towering Inferno, if you've seen that movie. It's now kind of old school and old time, but they go that far back, which is the beginning, and that's step one, because what we're, we're trying to get Ken is a Lifetime Achievement Award. It's, it's not for one specific thing he did, it's for everything he did. And you can pick it apart and go, well, this book he, he did was so-so, or this book wasn't that good, or this comic, or this, this fan scene, because he did it all. Oh, we might get my PowerPoint presentation yet here. Then I can go to my notes, and not, not that hot. So, um, so <clears throat> right before World War II, as the draft is starting to come up, Ken got involved with his pals in a mail order business because this was Ken's big strength. He was always the super salesman. He could sell anybody anything, and he had a way about him that, that well, this is what we're celebrating. This is the trivia. And uh, he created a mailing list. It's a real simple thing. But this mailing list became key. It was for his own book hustle deal, to sell books to people that he had met through the amateur press associations and, and get them to buy product from him. So, you know, he'd get all the cheap books he could and, you know, make his profit. Well, this, this list became a key to the evolution of science fiction. Uh, a couple of partners got together, a guy named Don Grant and uh, Tom Hadley. And they had this idea. They lived in, in uh, Rhode Island, and they, which was a famous hometown of H.P. Lovecraft. And there were still people living who had known him in person. And they got a hold of some previously unprinted materials, some anecdotal and colorful information about H.P. Lovecraft. They put it together on what's called a little chapbook, which is a variation of a fancy, uh, you know, something anybody could do, eight and a half by 11, with lots of photos and, and copied by these people that knew him. Well, that, that, got, that was very successful sales. So they said, well, let's go to the next step, hardbound book. Well, they scratched their head and tried to come up with a concept for a hardbound book. Tom Hadley had family money, so they had a lot of money to put into this. As they sort of fumbled around with this concept, they reached the problem that most everybody does even today, sales, distribution and sales. You might have wonderful ideas for your product, but if you can't give them out to the people, if you can't reach the people, you're not going to make your sales. So as much as people discount the salesman, the hustler, somebody with energy to get these things going, the, the Ken Kruger type of person, uh, they needed him. And that, that mailing list that he used throughout World War II while he was on and tour and on duty came to the forefront when Don Grant and Tom Hadley approached him and said, well, look, we've got this idea for a book. And it's a great idea, and Ken agreed, but they didn't know how to sell it. No. Ken knew. And what they did was they produced the first hardbound copy of The Scarlark of Space, Doc Smith's, E. Smith's book, The Scarlark of Space, which had only see, previously seen print in the magazines that they had grown up on, that they, in, in the 
1926 and it uh, first appeared. And it's a one, wonderful book. It, it's well worth reading. It holds up even today. It's space opera at its best, but like I say, it has a certain charm that transcends the, the two or three generations now between. And this was, this was Ken's doing. And I got this straight from him. He produced the logo for Buffalo Press, the imprint, the publishing house, decided on the book, sold the book through his distribution list. Well, then Ken got called back into duty as Korea starts revving up. Tom Grant and, Jesus, this is just not like it. Okay. Um, decide they want to keep on publishing. They're having problems with their publishing. They are approached by Lloyd Eschbach, who is the publisher of Fantasy Press, if you're familiar with any of the specialty houses. Fantasy Press has one main attribute, not the selection of the stories, but the quality of their, their production. And he pr produced an exquisite book. He wrote a tell-all book in his late 70s and early 80s where they reviewed the past. And like, I love the political, we need political camp now. It's very revisionist. And part of the revision is like last man standing. Whoever tells the story, <coughs> pretty much gets to create this stance that everybody else will follow. And if they tell lies, or mistruths, or half-truths, nonetheless, that's what's remembered. So Lloyd Eschbach's revision on it was to sell Ken short, even though the first thing that, that Lloyd did for his business was take that mailing list. So now two imprints. And basically, three, when Tom Hadley lost Don Grant as a partner and started his own publishing company. This is the story of specialty publishing. Specialty publishing in science fiction means right at the end of World War II. Before then, very few hardbound copies of any science fiction had ever appeared. It was all in the magazines. It was thought of as woo woo stuff, you know, but never make money in hardbound books. So the, the main houses that were in existence. Um, Simon and Schuster, Random House, that later got into publishing science fiction, walked away from it, took a pass on it. They just didn't think there was money into it until people like Ken came on board and made the first hardbound copy. So they made the first hardbound science fiction book, The Skylark of Space. Important book, seminal to the industry, it, because it has been repeated, uh, reprinted so many times since. And all the partners, as they broke up almost immediately, took that mailing list and created the next step of their businesses. And because they didn't really have energy, they might have had talent and ability, but they did not have energy to persist. Every one of these subsequent publishers went out of business, including Lloyd Eshda, like I say, produces a great book. You can look at Fantasy Press on, on eBay, and these books sell for $100 plus dollars a piece, and he did this limited sign thing, and those books can come. Heinlein's first edition signed uh, on a special limited press run, going from $1,200 to $1,600 now on eBay. So the books are highly collectible because they're the first books, not just the quality and content, because the content and many of them make you scratch your head and want to go, why did they publish this book? But there are a few good ones, like I say, and this is, pertains to Ken. Ken Lack the money, the deep pockets to produce high quality books, but he had the knack, as always, even with people, of finding people, diamonds in the rough, and, and, and turning his dimes into dollars. So he produced a nice run of books, and the quality of the content is first rate. There are very few dogs in his collection of books that, that he produced in science fiction. But just like his, him in general, Ken in general, he, he, he had the end in him. And one of his early fanzines, in a time when it was probably one of the most profane words in existence, he called abortions. Not a good selection for a title of a fanzine to make good friends. And it, it opened up people's eyes and people looked at him. But uh, that seemed to be his way. Uh, kind of some rubbed a lot of the people in science fiction fan in the wrong way and just moved away from science fiction. In the mid-60s, there was a big sea change where publishers and I guess they'd come of age. They left Chicago, which was the hub, 
New York, Chicago, Central Hub for, for Science Fiction and Publishing, and he came on here to San Diego and Ken followed, opening up his Ocean Beach bookstore, which has been talked about and known, where a group of people that will be speaking about it met Ken uh, for the first time. And there's an expression in science fiction that they make up, made up languages. Kathy, get out of fandom. He got out of fandom and pretty much didn't go back into publishing any kind of science fiction. But what, what he did, and the longevity and the spirit behind it, I think deserve, he deserves a lifetime achievement award for. People who have done less but were better known have gotten this award. The simple facts and why it's politics, and I'll go back over some of the details, is the, one of the differences between comic fandom and science fiction fandom is everybody's a participant in science fiction fandom. If you're a, a, an attending member or even a supporting member at the upcoming World Science Fiction Convention, you get to vote for your selection for the best writer, best artist, best category, which, whoever in what category. Not only that, as either a supporting or attending member, you get to set up the nominations. Enough people can nominate or select individual. The politics are that simple. And the numbers are that simple, too. Because just like in this room, very few people get involved in the political side of con running. And certainly not in the, in the world science fiction arena. And I don't know comic con politics, but since they don't really have a, uh, and have never established a real award system, that there are award systems outside, I don't know how political they get. Uh, whether a, a body of people. Now, the attending membership of the World Con is like 1,200 people. And just like in any group, less than a third of the people will vote for these things. That leaves voting for what the best science fiction novel of the year is in the hands of three to 400 people. And the real decisive votes, of course, are, are accomplished at the convention when attending members get together, there's a voting enclave, and do their campaigning and vote for who should be number one, and who will get the next convention. And since conventions are big money, these, all, these issues all tie in together. And it, it, my gambit to get Ken award, the simple of, of it is to first make the commit, committee for the 2013 World Science Fiction Convention aware that the regard that we hold Ken so that they will open up the nominating process to Kent because it's a, it's, a, it's a benign dictatorship. The committee that runs that year's con gets to decide what awards are being offered. They can say, well, this year we're not going to offer a Hugo Award, which is their, their equivalent to an Oscar. It's the highest award you can get from fandom for, for, your, for your, your writing or your, your, your whatever you created. There's the Nebula, which is off a uh, the next group where the writers among themselves do the political social thing and decide who amongst who's first among equals. But the Hugo's fans, and there's always been fans, and first the committee, because they're in control of everything, has to be put on notice that we want to open up nominations and then award a lifetime achievement. The lifetime achievement is not always offered every year. Some committees offer a scad of, of awards. Others taper it down. Who knows why? And there's big debates before and after why they're only offering seven Hugos this year when they offered 20 Hugos the year before. Go figure. So first you have to put them on notice. Make them aware that you know they've forgotten about Ken. We haven't. He's very popular in comic books. Well, here's the crossover. For the first time, rather than science fiction feeding into comics, comics can feed back into science fiction and give them feedback. The next is I wanted to find people here who might either be supporting members or attending members so they can represent the cause, help represent the cause. It's going to boil down to about 20 people. 20 attending people at that, that convention, I can prove this point, can control all, all the Hugo Awards, period. That's simple. That's the bottom line. And that's kind of intriguing, I think, and especially when it's a worthy cause. So we have simple politics, simple numbers, and, and a reason why. It's, it's, I think of it as foolproof. I mean, why not do it? So, here's our can. That's one of my favorite um, drawings because it's by Milk Caniff, Terry and the Pirates. My middle name is Terry. I have an affinity for Terry and the Pirates. 
I think my parents named me Terry because of Terry and the Pirates, so Milk Cannon has figured into uh, my life well. This, this is a Ken, that's Slanchek. Here's Ken and Frank Robinson, noted famous science fiction writer. Here's E. Everett Evans, science fiction writer. These were the early greats. This is First Standard. This is a group of First Standard. These guys were at the very beginning. Before them, there was nothing. They got together. They got into amateur press. They socialized that way. Then they decided to get together. The significance of Shan Sh the Slan Shack is, even though there were conventions, this was really the first convention center. They decided that they were going to live a certain collective lifestyle. It was kind of popular communism and their socialism or ideas at the time. And they tried to embrace these utopian ideas. And so for a brief while, all these people got together and shared everything, everything. And this is unique because this is the mid-30s. And uh, Ken was there. Here's a better shot. This, this picture appears in uh, a wonderful book, All Our Yesterdays. I mean, maybe I imagined it, maybe I imagined it, but it seemed like his eyes were watering. I mean, like there was some kind of sentiment. sentiment I, I, I think you're right. And, I, you know, I mean, and it was from a distance, and because of the press of, I mean, the pressing amount of people in the room, I could not get over to talk to him, which, of course, I regret horribly. Oh, but still, that must have been great gratifying. It was. It was, because it was like he was just there, him, you know, I mean, there were people but he was on the stage standing there, and, and okay, I didn't imagine the sentiment. It was, it was there. It was an emotion. Yeah, it was. Mentioned. Yeah, it, it was. So. I, I what like we had done, this photograph here is from a dinner that we held at Felipe's, which was Ken's favorite restaurant. And um, I got together with David Scrogey and Scott Shaw, and we got a hold of everyone that we could that we knew that, you know, Ken's boys, right. not just his sons are sitting in the back of the room, but, you know, all the boys that, that he had helped throughout the years. And the only person that told me that he couldn't come, uh, mostly for health reasons, was Harlan. Yes. And I think if you're going after a Hugo, you should really talk to Harlan and Greg. And I think they probably have the strongest... Yes, but no. Um, since uh, Harlan's debacle with... Connie Willis is now a tropism. A tropism. Uh, Harlan's got <laughs> mad uh, Harlan Grote, major science fiction writer, Connie Willis, at an award symbol. The, the scandal beyond its criminal behavior. Sorry, you lose your, your political juice when you, when you cross lines. You're right, he's got the knack, he's got the pull, but, but he's, he's on everybody's. Bad boy list. Well, Not in the good way. Yeah, Harlan's always the I was going to say, I can show you pictures list. of him groping me when I was 19. So. <laughs> I'm glad he wasn't into boys, let me tell you. Now that was Shell. Um, <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. I didn't mean to like the hands of some of those. There he is. Well, Greg is still around. Greg's a great guy, and yes, you know, I I, I think he he just learned a lot That's about the well, I'm being that circle tonight. I'm, I'm, I'm possibly good. got some chats in mind for Greg. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this game. Yeah. Well, here's the Rogues Gallery. Yeah, there's a Rogues Gallery. Line them up. The boys. It's a good thing no one had an Uzi. Uh, <laughs> All right. <laughs> A couple of major dinner, you guys would never have your party where you can get <laughs> on stage. And, you know, it's the, uh, the Robert Down Downey Jr. moment when he's oh, yeah, Charlie Chaplin, where he's at the end of his days and they bring him back finally for his Oscar. Yeah, I think that's got to be how Ken felt. I've always been curious. Yeah. I, I clipped the photo a little, but now I'm not, not to tell what Ken is studying. And I couldn't figure that part out. Part and parcel of this photo is collecting every photo I can of Ken's that's out there is to identify, in the long run, for historical purposes, the question that everybody wants answered is who are these people? What's it's always lacking is context. How do you get an award? Well, what did you do? Who were you? What, what, who are these people? Who, who are these people that think you well, need this I think this that's award? Bill Wentz standing next to Scott Shaw. 
Yeah, that is Bill Lund. Yeah, yeah, him, him and all of them. I tried to try to Bill get him in. That David didn't Clark. come. David Clark's over yeah, on this no. side next to Roger. Yeah. It's yeah. terrible for a song pass to look at a young guy that could create freedom from five years ago. You know, age keeps coming. That's why we have to move fast and do these things. So there's my Ken. That's the, the, the pro picture I like of it. But this is the this is Paul Ganley, who's you know another another one of these guys. In other words, next. Next project, guys. And here's my favorite photo, Ken. So that's who Ken is and how we know him in comics. Uh, 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 kind of a basic run through of what's what science fiction he did. And Here's what he did. Space trips. One of the early incarnations of Shroud, but under what he called Pegasus. This is when he was, and this was a popular medium. Um, everybody had Mimeos or, or, or uh, ditto machines, and they were learning how to transfer artwork to them. And this particular one is a very collectible item because Bob Pucker, Wilson Pucker, wrote the story for it. This is the first print of that, that story. It's Ken again showing his talent, finding diamonds in the rough, and getting their first out there, their first out there. They didn't have deep pockets. They didn't have deep pockets to go after original material, solicit the original material from living writers, but they could get their reprint rights. And these are the first two science fiction hard, hard bounds. There were others, don't get me wrong, but there were onesie twosies, and not, not too many. From this moment forward, it started, and all the pocketbooks you see in the store, uh, now what's on television that came from science fiction, this is the well it came from. This is the point it started from. Before this, there was nothing. It was the first, this is the beginning, he did it. That's lifetime achievement in my book. There it is. And believe it or not, the cover looks that bad. There, there are two variants of it for those that are into this. There's a the yellow and, and blue background, I couldn't get Ken to tell, tell me which was first. I hate that when I got some, I had so rare access to somebody who's first source. And then when they can't remember, and I know, you know, it's like, I have, you know, it's one thing to just have to rely on a secondary source for facts. And for book dealers and collectors, it's important because if you're into it, major difference between first state and second state. And in 50 more years, significant money. So this is the second edition of the book, that popular. But a year or so, less than about two years later, this one came out. The second edition of the reprint was that successful. Then, so successful, Scarlet Space went to a third edition, hardbound. First hardbound go to three successive editions by three different publishers. By now, Simon Schuster were picking up science fiction. They weren't quite ready to dive into it big time. That was about to happen. And the uh, mass marketing of them, because their better distribution was about to happen. Another Ken Kruger design logo, Trout, his most significant imprint. This is the cash cow, or however you want to look at it. This is the one that did all, all of it. This is, this is it. He used this imprint on everything. There's a comic book he did. Shroud did it. Uh, there's little mini booklets, his fanzines, they're all Shroud publications from this point on. Pegasus got dropped, Shroud picked up. This is back cover. I, I almost can join them one, one figure, but the artwork too. Um, Charlie Momberger did the artwork. He's still alive. I tried to get him to write a little something about that part, but uh, um, time has taken its toll. Maker of Moons. This is back to the selection of the books. Maker of Moons. Just a little comment on the books itself, why they're significant. Turn of the century, not this century, the last century, original publication. One time in an English magazine. Uh, Chinese sorcerers having power over, over the moon and, and in a metaphysical way that, that comes into reality. Uh, the importance of these books is they stand the test of time. A lot of old science fiction, even the magazines, even as early as 20 years ago, just does not stand up. It's full of time-dated references. Uh, the language is stilted. 
Not one of Ken's has that flaw. Look behind you. All right. Look behind you. Hey, you can scratch your head and go, oh, what is, what is this one? Never appeared anywhere else. Char Charlie did the jacket again. Uh, very few copies were printed. It's Trout again. We're, talk not, we're in the mid-50s right now. He's got a few more years before comics come along. It's a collection of short stories. I read every one of them because I had to answer that question. What, what is the quality of this book? Gems, I could put this book out in a POD in a day and it would sell. More of the fantastic artwork. This is, this is uh, without the dust jacket. The production of the booklet, it's a digest sized booklet. It is intentionally very well done within the means possible. So even the, bind, the binding itself was a mystery. And you can see, spiral bound. And that's where people get the, that attitude about Ken. Well, this isn't you know, perfect bound. It's not a library archival paper. It's not always quality. It's content of the character, too. Here, this one I, I like because here they are in their day. The writer, it's a poetry, and Charlie. These are service buddies. Came up from high school and into the service. Lasting friends, pals for life. Great book. Attention to detail, the actual binding. Here they're trying to hide the, this is their attempt at perfect binding. First attempts, hard take to, to adhere everything together. These are amateurs putting these things together in every way. Boyd Eschbach with Fantasy Press had one step up. He was a printer, so he printed the books he was publishing. There, there are no other middlemen. Nobody else wanted to take on the task. Now here's the book. If, if, if Scarlet and Space doesn't raise eyes at the World Con, this one should. We're, we're now back to the root of all. This is horror and fantasy at its best. H.P. Lovecraft. This is the first independent publication of Dreamcast Unknown Cadet. This book, this is the hardbound dust jacket for it. And he went hardbound with this. There are several states of this one. A limited number that he signed, a Ken sign. I'm talking about Ken. Uh, saw a, a, a limited number, there were trade editions, and then a soft cover edition. This book, uh, there's one copy in about this condition selling on eBay right now, and they're asking 1700 bucks for it. Just, and it's one story. So a small book. Uh, it's well valued among collectors. And the story holds up well. Now, I hate to say it, this one didn't cut it for me. I hate to say it. This was uh, Ken sort of stayed with his roots, science fiction. This is murder mystery. Not good. I have to say that. Uh, maybe this is me. I'll let you put it there. The murder mystery didn't appeal to me. Now, this is the, one of the best, almost perfect actual house. It's the, the moon maker rather than maker moons. Collectors on note for that. This is so early. This was done, here's my date. Oh my, can't find, here it is. 1958, originally 1915, in a magazine. This is one of the best accounts I've ever read of an actual trip to the moon. They keep it straight. And there's no gravity, the problems with oxygen, uh, the practicalities of moving mass. Uh, I enjoy it. I read a lot of old turn of the century literature that I can't finish because the language or the concepts. I can't read a lot of current science fiction because they lack even basic explanations of the problems in physics. Like, who hasn't seen a science fiction movie where there's gravity in the spaceship? How could that be? And if they don't offer any kind of even semi-plausible explanation, there ain't no gravity out there. This is another gem. This is Pearson Island. You could tell about now 
that Ken was getting to be at the end of his science fiction publishing career. There's one more trick that's going to come. This one almost went back to his fanzine roots. Uh, but thank you. This is, this is back to a Ditto machine, probably going to be held, stapled. There are eight. This one is one of his first really illustrated endeavors. 18 illustrations. And because of the way he produced the illustrations, it, every one is a color. So there's not one per, specific first state cover. They're all first state covers, all the illustrations. The story itself is a, a gem of uh, the macabre. It's a, a hideous story of a, a sailor shipwrecked on an island where this, this castle bleeds blood and, and, and there are strange mystical witchy things and everyone is accounted for in a practical way at, at the end of it. But you're, you're thinking it's all witchcraft and supernatural until every one of these encounters with the, with the mystical side is, is revealed as a, in a very physical, practical way, which is elegant because most of these things are left in the woo supernatural. I, I don't need to explain what's going on. Then Ken was done. Food for demons. You remember the first photo I showed you of him in Slam Shack? E. Everett Evans? Well, uh, Mr. Evans had died, and the people that knew him, Bray Bradbury among them, each selected one of the short stories that Evans did and wrote um, about Evans, just like we're talking about Ken. And this is a, a tribute book for E. Everett Evans. So, kind of started the whole conventioneering thing. See, Ken was that loyal. And this is a comic book under the shot in you know, This is the crossover. And it brings us to more reprints. Ken couldn't give it up. These were all done with your smiling maker of moons. He liked these stories, went at him again. And that's my tale of Ken. So where does that leave us as a quick recap? Now we know who Ken was, is. We certainly know him in comics. We've seen what he did, heard how important he is to us. So I think we need to tell the World Con Committee what it means to us. And I came up with what I think is an ingenious idea and I'm floating a petition. And all this petition is, is us here attending this convention want to tell you there at your convention how much we think of Ken and that we think he deserves a lifetime achievement award. What I'm looking for amongst us, like we were talking about a moment ago, is I'm not enough to just get this thing done. I mean, me being an attending member does X. Now, get Greg Bear or somebody like this to help lead the charge. I think we've got a good shot at making this happen. Okay. So first step, step up and sign it. And you can get an official I voted for Ken sticker. <laughs> I got the flashy one. I'm the only one with the flashy one. And I have a whole lot of these. And the idea was to promote Ken here now.